Okay, guys. T. Of course, this is Friday's class, our last class of the week. So, of course, because it's Friday, our plan for today is to do some more not thinking. I don't have the microphone. Can people still hear me? Probably. Okay, so yeah, sorry guys, I gotta hook up the microphone. Uh, but, yeah, anyhow, we need to do some review today, right? Before you guys are able to take your quiz, <clears throat> whether that's the oral and also the written quiz, right? So, what we'll be doing is, of course, some grammar review in the first class, along with some vocabulary review. In our second class, we will be doing speaking practice, which is always kind of strange in the online classes, but I will be modeling some answers, and if you are here, if you want to write down an answer to a question, that would be great. And lastly, for our elective, we have a song, so it should be quite fun. Now, a lot of the review in the first class, this is going to be pretty boring because we are reviewing things that we talked about on Tuesday and Thursday. But I think it's a good idea, guys, to take a look at this sheet here. Try to find the sheet where it says comparative and superlative adjectives at the top. And we have that table again. I know we looked at this table earlier on Tuesday and also a little bit yesterday, but it is really, really useful. So let's run through this quickly. I'm not going to write the table on the board. I think that's a little bit useless, but take a look at the top left. We're talking about the adjective forms first, then the comparative form, and then the superlative form of that adjective. And of course, our first one, we're looking at adjectives with only one syllable ending in E. Okay, so if we have a one syllable adjective, Ending in an E, words like wide, fine, or cute. The rule here for the comparative is to simply add R. Wider, <coughs> finer, cuter. For the superlative form, we need to add ST because we already have the E, right? Widest, finest, cutest, right? And there we go. Okay, pretty simple stuff. Moving on further down the list, the next one we have is, again, only one syllable, but with one vowel and one consonant at the end. So our examples here are hot, big, fat. Now, the rule here for converting it into the comparative form is to double the consonant and then add ER. So we've got hotter, bigger, fatter. The superlative rule here is again to double the consonant and then add EST. Hottest, biggest, fattest. And there we go. Okay, so just remember if you have a very short adjective, usually just with three letters, and it goes consonant, vowel, consonant, you double the consonant, you add ER for the comparative, or you double the consonant, and then you add EST for the superlative form. Okay, now one more one we're going to take a look at that's only one syllable is the next one. So the next one, the third one here, only one syllable with more than one vowel and more than one consonant at the end. So these tend to be adjectives that have four or more letters, but they are just one syllable. <clears throat> so light, neat, and fast, for example. These ones here, you will add ER for the comparative. That's all you need to do is add an ER. So light becomes lighter, neat becomes neater, fast becomes faster. For the superlative form, all you need to do is add the EST. So light becomes lightest, neat becomes neatest, and fast becomes fastest. Okay, great. So let's move on to one that's a little bit more complicated, and this is when we have two syllables, but this time it's ending in a Y. So our examples are like happy, silly, lonely. Now, when we convert them into the comparative form, we need to remove that Y and replace it with an I. And then we add ER, right? 
So happy becomes happier, silly becomes sillier, and lonely becomes lonelier, right? For the superlative form, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're removing the Y and replacing it with an I, but then adding EST, right? So happy becomes happiest, silly becomes silliest, and lonely becomes loneliest. And there we go. All right, guys. Now, of course, a lot of the adjectives that you're going to be encountering and going to be using in the comparative and superlative form are going to have two or more syllables, and they're not going to end in Y, right? So adjectives like modern, interesting, and beautiful, right? If you think about beautiful, beautiful, that's three syllables, not ending in Y. Modern, two syllables, not ending in Y. Interesting, four syllables, and again, not ending in Y. So what do we do with these ones? These ones, the rule is actually pretty simple if you think about it. For the comparative form, you are just going to simply add the word more before the adjective, right? So modern becomes more modern. Beautiful becomes more beautiful. Interesting becomes more interesting. And when it comes to the adjective form for the superlative form, you just need to add most instead of more, right? Most beautiful, most interesting, most modern, right? Now, again, though, it's also important to remember that, like, with the superlative form, you need to add the as well, right? Like, he is the most interesting person, right? He is, she is the most beautiful woman. Um, this is the most modern city I have ever traveled to, right? Okay, guys, so we got this one done, but of course, I'd like you to take a look at the back side where we have some exceptions. We have some irregular ones, right? So if you look at the back side, you've got irregular forms and we have irregular comparative and superlative forms. Some comparative and superlative forms are irregular. They don't follow the same rules that the other ones do, right? So what we've got here is we've got an adjective and an adverb on the left. We have their comparative form, their superlative, and then we have an example, right? So guys, let's think about this here. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got things like good or well. Now, good and well will be converted into the comparative and superlative form in the same way, right? So good and well, the comparative form is just better, and the superlative form is just the best, right? So good, better, the best. Well, better, the best. Done. Now, our example here is, you are the best singer in the show, or you are the best singer in the world. Wow, that's really awesome, right? Okay, now on the other hand, the opposite of good, the opposite of well, would be bad or badly for the adverb form, right? Okay, so bad becomes worse in the comparative form, and for the superlative form, we have the worst, right? Like, he is bad but she is worst. However, that guy, he is the worst, right? And it's good that for the superlative form here, they also really emphasize that you have to add the before you make the superlative form. Okay, now little is also, you know, the comparative form and superlative form is also irregular. We don't say littler or littlest, right? We say little becomes less, and the superlative form is the least. Yeah, so give me less sugar, for example, right? I want the least, the least amount of sugar, and that is little. Now, if you're going to be using many, whether it's in the adjective or adverb form, when you're converting it to the comparative form, you've got more. In the superlative form, it is the most, right? So the example here is, I want more coffee. Okay, I want lots of coffee. Oh, I want more coffee. I want the most coffee, right? And the last two ones that we have here are both far, but there is a difference here. The first one is far, and is in the adjective and adverb form as well. But the first one here is talking about actual physical distance, right? And far becomes farther, 
and the farthest, right? Now it says, Alaska is the farthest away from home that I have ever been. Okay, that's good. Now the next far here though, and this could be kind of confusing for people, again, it's in the adjective and adverb form, but this is about abstract distance. So let, let's think about this. Now, the way you convert it is different. In the comparative form, instead of farther, it's further with an U instead of an A. And in the superlative form, it becomes the furthest. So you might be thinking like, what? Like, okay, I don't really get it. What is the difference between using far as in physical distance and using far as in abstract distance? Like, what, what is that? Well, look at the example. The example here says, let's discuss this problem further tomorrow, right? So you're going to discuss the problem further into the future. But this is not an actual physical distance. And that's why, in this case, they're using further in the comparative form, right? OK, guys, so that is kind of complicated. But the, to be honest, there aren't too many irregular adjective forms that you know, when converted into the comparative or superlative form, do not follow the five basic rules. But there are some. So it is kind of good to know these ones here. And honestly, sometimes it's better just to memorize these things, right? When it comes to the actual comparative and superlative rules on the first page, of course, this is really essential, right? Like, you need to know how to convert adjectives into the comparative and superlative form. And you need to remember the five different forms. Right? You need to remember only one syllable ending in an E. Just add an R or add ST. Only one syllable, but a three-letter word with a vowel and then a consonant at the end. You need to double that consonant. right? You need an add ER for the comparative. Or double the consonant and then add EST for the superlative. But when it comes to Another form of only one syllable adjectives, but with multiple, more than one vowel or more than one consonant, so usually four letters or more. In this case, you are going, and especially if they end with a, well, they always end with a consonant, you're just going to add ER for the comparative, and for the superlative, you're going to add EST. So I think the first three rules where you're talking about adjectives with only one syllable, these can get a bit confusing sometimes, right? Because you're going to be like, oh, is that a short letter word with only, is, should I double the consonant? Or, oh, OK, it's got an E at the end. What do I do? Oh, yeah, I just add R, or add ST, right? Or like, oh, it's like, it's one syllable, but it's, there's quite a few letters. Oh, OK and it ends with a consonant, I'm just going to add an ER, I'm just going to add an EST, right? It can get a tiny bit confusing, but I think it's good to review this and make sure you understand it. And I do think with the other two rules, right, when you have two syllables ending in a Y, that one looks like the most complicated, but it really isn't, right? You just remove that Y, replace it with an I, and then add either ER for the comparative or add EST for the superlative form. OK, yes. And of course, the last one I think is actually kind of an easy rule. Like if you have a longer adjective, two or more syllables, and it's not ending with a Y, then you're just adding more, the word more for the comparative form, more intelligent, more modern, more interesting, more beautiful. Or for the superlative form, you're going to be adding most, right? And also the, we should keep that in mind. The most interesting, the most beautiful, the most intelligent, right? OK, guys, now that we've gone over that in a little bit of detail, what I think would be good to do now is to kind of go back to that series of worksheets we had from Teach This. Um, we looked at this yesterday. We did some of the exercises, some of the other exercises we skipped. Um, but take a look back at the comparatives and superlatives practice. And I think a good idea would be to take a look at B. Because B here, we just kind of skipped this. And I told you guys, hey, 
why don't you just do this for practice, right? So if you guys did take a look at this and fill it in, then this should be good. It should be good review. But also, if you didn't do this, then that's fine. We'll do it together, right? Now, we'll take a look at the top. We had cheap, cheaper, cheapest, beautiful, more beautiful, most beautiful. Um, we looked at pretty. We looked at easy. We looked at big. We looked at light. So actually, let's get started with heavy. So I'm going to recreate this on the board. So we've got our adjective. Then we have our comparative. And then lastly, we have our superlative form. OK, so let's get started with heavy. Heavy. Right? Now think about it. Heavy. Two syllables, right? Heavy. Ending in a Y. So the rule we are following here is the fourth rule. We need to remove the I and, or sorry, <laughs> remove the Y and replace it with an I and then, of course, add ER, right? So heavy, of course, becomes heavier, right? And the superlative form here, what are we going to do? Of course, we're going to remove the I again, or we're going to remove the Y again and then we're going to replace it with I and then EST. So heavy and heaviest. Right? That truck is heavy, but that other truck is heavier, but of course the building is the mo or the heaviest, right? Oh god. Okay, next one guys. We got heavy done. Let's take a look at fast. Fast is nice and easy. Of course, fast is one syllable, right? And we've got two vowels, or sorry. Oh my god, I must be tired this morning. Uh, we've got one vowel, constant, consonant. Okay. So this one here is not following the second rule where we need to double the consonant. Instead, it's following just the third rule where we have you know, a one syllable word with more than one vowel, more than one uh, consonant, and we have a consonant at the end. So we're just going to add ER, pretty simple, faster. And then of course for the superlative form, fastest. And there we go, pretty easy stuff. OK, on to the next one, reliable. Oh, good adjective. And I hope you guys know what reliable means. Like, if you describe something or somebody uh, as being reliable, if you say, you know, John is a reliable guy, or uh, Apple iPhones are very reliable, what you're saying is that you can trust them. Like, they don't break down easily if it's a product, right? Or they will not betray your trust. You can always tell them your secrets, they're a reliable person. Or John is a reliable worker, right? He's always on time, he does his job, he's not joking around, right? Now, reliable here, reliable. We've got four syllables, right? So this is going to be following the fifth and final rule, where we're just going to be adding more, right? More reliable, right? And for our superlative form, we're just going to be using most, right? Most reliable. OK, great. Let's move on to our next one. We have slow. You know, John is slow, but Peter, you know, maybe a bit more. Now, actually, <laughs> this one here is going to be following the same rule as fast. So we've got a four-letter word, one syllable, um, so we're not going to be doubling the consonant, we're just going to be adding uh, ER. That's all we need to do. So slow becomes slower. John is slow, but Peter is slower. And uh, Brian is the slowest, right? So pretty simple stuff. Okay, moving on down the list, we've got new. I want a new car. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> that's not important. Now, new here, we've got N-E-W. OK, so what does new become, right? What new is a short word. That's true. And you might be thinking, OK, we need to double the consonant here, right? But unfortunately, no. No, we don't. New, we just convert it into new-er. 
and with the superlative form newest. And that is all. Okay. Next one we have is de, 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 ry. Now, think about that word. It says three letters, right? D R Y. But how many syllables? Dry. It's not de, ry, right? De, ry. It's not. It's just dry. But dry is ending with a Y. So it's kind of easy to guess how we're going to convert this, right? Now, you could say de rye, de rye. I guess possibly it is two syllables. Dry, 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 de rye, de rye. Yeah, it is two syllables, I guess. That's weird. But anyhow, it ends with a Y. So we need to remove that Y and replace it with an I. And then add R-E-R. -E dry, dryer, and dry S. Now, that is, I probably never said the superlative form of dry before like oh like that's dry but <laughs> that thing is drier and that is the driest I don't know what situation you would really be using this in but yeah like that is the correct form it's just I don't think I've ever used the comparative or superlative form of dry before anyhow let's take a look at happy now happy is definitely two syllables it's ending with a y so our rule here is pretty simple. We're going to replace the Y with an I, then add ER. Happy becomes happier. And lastly, it becomes happiest. And there we go. All right, so easy peasy, right? Let's take a look at the next one. One of my favorite adjectives, old, uh, because I like old people. Mm. All right, so old becomes a pretty easy one. You're just going to be adding ER. You don't need to double the consonant here. Old, older, and oldest, right? Okay, and those comparative and superlative forms you'll definitely be using. So, old is good. Let's take a look at nice. Not Nice, not the city in southern France, but anyhow, nice. We've already got an E at the end, so when we're converting it, we don't really need to do much for the comparative form. I'm just going to add that R, right? Nice, nicer, and of course, nicest. All right, guys, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, we finished more than half of the list. Okay, we've got a few more adjectives here, though, uh, but I have run out of room. So if you guys did this for homework, I hope you got the same answers here. If not, then this is good review. But let me erase what I have so far on the list, and then we'll just continue here. So, dun, 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 dun. okie dokie, all right, and we are good. Okay, so next one we have here is compact, compact. All right, so compact is two syllables, right? is not ending with a Y. So when we have two or more syllables not ending in a Y, what do we do? We need to add words for the comparative and superlative forms, right? So compact will become more compact. And for the superlative form, the most compact. And of course, a lot of people, like, well, compact is kind of a useful adjective. It means it can be made into something small that can easily fit inside something, right? So a lot of people, well, these days, most laptops are quite compact. They're quite thin, right? But, you know, like a lot of people like maybe like MacBook Airs because they're very compact and they're very thin, right? Um, anyhow, so that's compact. Next one we have here is tasty. Tasty is a good adjective because, you know, if you're talking about food, you don't want to always say like, oh, this is delicious or this is disgusting, right? Like that's really good and that's really bad. Um, sometimes you want to use different adjectives to describe food. And instead of saying delicious, you can say, wow, that's tasty, right? That's tasty. That's yummy. It's yum yum, right? It's it's really good. And then instead of saying disgusting, you should try to use, you know, a more casual or of a slang term you could use gross right oh this food is gross i don't like it right 
Of course, you shouldn't say that to the cook, but anyhow. Um, now, taste T, right? You've got two syllables ending with a Y. So we know what to do, right? We're following our fourth rule. We're removing the Y and replacing it with an IER, right? So taste T becomes, of course, tastier. And the superlative form, of course, is EST, tastiest. Okay, next one we have here is bitter. Now, bitter is another good adjective that a lot of people don't, probably don't use enough, because um, bitter can be used in two different ways. Like, usually it's used when you're describing food, right? You say, oh, this food is very bitter. This tea is very bitter, and tea usually is bitter, right? Unless you add sugar. Uh, bitter is the opposite of sweet, right? Many people like sweet foods, but some people like bitter foods where there's no, there's no sugar, right? There's not much of a taste. It's got a, well, it has a taste, but it's a bitter taste, right? So lots of different kinds of tea without sugar are quite bitter, right? But bitter can also be used to describe somebody's personality. If you say John, is a very bitter guy. Well, it kind of has the, like, again, you could also say somebody's sweet. You know, Sarah's a very sweet girl, right? And in that sense, it means she's very nice, um, like, kind of helpful, kind of cute, right? But John, he's a bitter guy. He's kind of angry. He's not nice. He's a little bit mean. So that's the meaning of bitter if you use it to describe someone's personality. But bitter, bitter. We've got two syllables, not ending in a Y. So our rule here, of course, is the same as compact. It is more bitter and most bitter. John is the most bitter person I know in the whole world. OK, so that's bitter. Next term we have here is advanced, right? Advanced technology. It's very advanced. Wow, Tesla cars are very advanced, right? Well, actually, I should use a different example. I'll use it later, but advanced. Actually, only two syllables, even though there's a lot of letters here. Advanced, advanced. Now, obviously, it's two syllables, not ending in a Y. So again, we're following the same rule that we would with compact and with bitter. So more advanced and the most advanced. And there we go. Now maybe if you were talking about cars, you'd say like, you know, Toyota cars are quite advanced. But uh, BMWs are more advanced than Toyotas. However, on the other hand, Teslas are the most advanced, right? And there we go. Okay. Moving on to the second to last one here, we have suitable. Suitable. So thinking about the number of syllables here, suitable, three syllables, no Y, following the same rule. So suitable becomes more suitable for the comparative form. And for the superlative form, of course, the most suitable. And there we go. Okay. All right, guys. So last one we got here on the list is warm. Okay. Warm. Don't confuse warm and worm. It sounds kind of similar, I guess. But anyhow, so we've got one here where we've got a four-letter word, one syllable. The rule here, of course, is ending with a consonant. It's pretty simple. Warmer and warmest. Uh, what is the warmest country I've ever been in? Oh, like, I guess I haven't traveled to too many countries like in the south, but probably Italy is the warmest country I've been in, or the U.S. when I went to California. But anyhow, so warm is pretty easy to convert. Warm, warmer, warmest, and we are good. I wanted to identify how we were modifying these. Anyhow, guys. So we got that list done. Now yesterday, we finished activity C. We finished activity D. And the only one we didn't finish was E, which again, I asked you guys to take a look at for homework instead. 
Um, I still think this is something that I don't really want to look at you guys. This is good practice. If you have extra time, please go over that yourselves, right? But what we should do, guys, is take a look again and do at this um, list of most commonly used English idioms. And let's go over the ones that I went over with you yesterday just to remind you of the meaning and maybe also provide you guys with some examples because the ones I looked at were really good. Um, it might take me a minute or two to remember all of the ones that I looked at because I put the sheet somewhere and it might be on the side, but I might have lost it. Give me, give me two seconds, two seconds. So this is like a real class, like when your teacher is kind of unprepared and forgot where they put something, they misplaced something. So I did misplace something, so give me a second. I'm taking a look. It is here somewhere. I did label it. Uh-oh, this is not, it's not looking too good. But even if I can't find it, of course, we can still take a look at it. Um, I just want to make sure that I go over the correct ones with you guys. Do, 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 where did, ah, okay, okay. Yay, I did find it. Hooray for me and hooray for you. All right, guys, so this list, uh, and again, like what I said yesterday, this is a list of the most commonly used English idioms that is actually true. Like, this is an excellent, excellent list, right? Um, it is really, really good. So the first one we took a look at was a hot potato. Mmm, sounds good, right? Especially if you like potatoes. And the, what they wrote down here for the meaning was to speak of an issue which many people are talking about and which is usually disputed. That is a good explanation. That explanation is correct. But I think an easier way to put it is just basically a controversial issue or topic, right? And that's it. So anyhow, a hot topic issue or a hot, sorry, hot topic. Well, that, that's also true, but a hot potato issue is one that people are often going to fight about, right? So yesterday, I think I gave you the example of like abortion, right? But another example would be, oh, a good one for the United States is in the United States, wearing a mask is currently a hot potato. So what I'm saying here is this issue of wearing a mask it is kind of a controversial subject right now, unfortunately, in the United States. The United States' top doctor, the one that Donald Trump chose to help fight the coronavirus, I think his name is Anthony Fauci or Fauci. He's a really, really smart guy. Um, he's been working on pandemics and infectious diseases for decades, right? He is a highly respected doctor. But he told everybody, like, you know, you should be wearing masks, right? You should protect yourself. But there's a lot of American people that are, you know, kind of into conspiracy theories or they just don't believe the top doctor. They think like, oh, the coronavirus is fake. It's invented by China, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe it. I'm not going to wear a mask. And so unfortunately, wearing a mask is currently a hot potato in the United States, which is unfortunate for Americans because a lot of Americans are dying right now. But anyhow, um, the next one we looked at was an arm and a leg. But actually, it was to cost an arm and a leg, right? So yeah, it's better to add cost an arm and a leg. But anyhow, to cost an arm and a leg. Just remember, if you're saying something costs an arm and a leg, what you're saying is something is very expensive. It's like the idea here is that something is so expensive 
that you should actually cut your arm off and you should cut your leg off and use them to pay because this thing is so pricey, right? So, of course, Vancouver is quite an expensive city. So, like, buying a house costs an arm and a leg in Vancouver, right? Um, I don't know, maybe in your guys' country, whether it's Brazil or... Uh, I heard in Brazil, actually, um, Apple products cost an arm and a leg, right? If you want a MacBook Pro, if you want an iPad, you want an iPhone, I heard they're about three or four times more expensive than they are in America or Canada, right? Actually, with any kind of electronic product, if you can get to the United States, they are super cheap in the United States. You can get a laptop, iPhone, iPad, whatever, and it's really, really cheap. Canada, a little bit more expensive for electronics than the United States, but I know lots of other countries, like I was always, I always thought it was weird, like in Korea, that, you know, like Korea produces a lot of electronics. Same with Japan, produce a lot of electronics. But they're not that cheap. Like the same product in Korea that you could find in the United States, the American one will be far cheaper than the Korean one, which really sucks for Korean consumers. But anyhow, uh, to cost an arm and a leg. And what else? What am I thinking about? Uh, okay, let's say lobster. Uh, usually, regardless of where you live, lobster costs an arm and a leg, right? Usually lobster in a restaurant is going to cost you quite a lot, right? Although it is quite yummy. Yum, yum. Okay, other ones here that we took a look at yesterday. Ah, two cut corners. Two cut corners basically means to do a bad job in order to save money or time, right? So some companies like construction companies, they cut corners, they don't use the right materials or they don't do a good job because they want to finish making that building as quickly as possible and they want to get money. But also sometimes us, you know, when we are students, Sometimes we cut corners, right? Like we're like, oh, I don't want to write this anymore. I'm just going to copy my friend or I'm going to find something online because in this case, we want to save time, right? But usually your professor, your teacher, your, you know, whatever. Oh, I didn't write an example for the other ones. Uh, but whoever, they will tell you, hey, don't cut corners. You need to do some hard work. So um, I don't know, my dad always, told me to not cut corners. Don't be lazy, don't cut corners. Okay, all right, but moving on guys. Um, our next one here, ah, every cloud has a silver lining. And this is a very optimistic expression. Every cloud has a silver lining. Um, so I think that like if you think of this, if you think of like the imagery of this, right? You see a cloud, it's a dark cloud, it's going to rain. And you know, that, that it can look like kind of negative or depressing or sad, right? But within the cloud, maybe there is a silver lining. So the meaning of this is like every problem, every obstacle that you have in life, yes, it may be bad, but there's always something good that could come out of it, right? So it's kind of like you're saying to people, hey, be optimistic even difficult times will lead to better days or you will be able to take advantage of something out of this problem. So I think the explanation here is good enough. Um, if I rewrote this, every cloud has a silver lining. Yeah, every problem also includes an opportunity. So actually, I should have thought of this example yesterday. Um, you know, we could say, of course, the coronavirus, right? Coronavirus has been awful. However, I, boo, 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 I have been able. to spend 
more time with <coughs> my family. So every cloud has a silver lining. So I think this one makes sense, right? Like, um, you know, all of us have been dealing with the coronavirus. Like, let's imagine that's like a cloud. That's like a problem. It's an issue, right? It sucks. It's not good. But because of that, myself and probably you as well, you've been able to spend more time with your family. So in that way, yeah, every cloud does have a silver lining. Yes, the coronavirus sucks, but get to spend some more time with your family members or if you have, I don't know, maybe you're living with roommates, maybe you spent more time with your roommates. You really got to know them. It turns out, you know, maybe a lot of your roommates are really cool people, right? Probably not, but you know. All right, guys, so we got hot potato, cost an arm and a leg, cut corners, every cloud has a silver lining. Awesome. Let's take a look at the other ones, but I'm just gonna erase this stuff here. So our next one is to feel a bit under the weather. Uh, which is a good expression and quite commonly used. Um, today, I don't feel under the weather, to be honest, but... Oh, when was that? Uh, Wednesday, I actually felt a bit under the weather because I think when I'm teaching these online classes, I'm talking too much and it stresses out my throat and then I feel kind of crappy afterwards. Crappy, not crappy. I feel a little bit bad afterwards. Anyhow, to feel a bit under the weather. And the meaning here is really, really simple, and they wrote it on the sheet. It means just feeling slightly ill, right? Or feeling a bit sick, right? And that's it. Um, so, I don't know, maybe you're starting to get a little bit of a cough, right? You're not coughing a lot, but you have a little bit of a cough. And maybe your nose is running, some mucus or snot is coming out. Not a lot, but a little bit, right? You're starting to feel sick. So you might say to somebody like, man, I am feeling a bit under the weather. Feeling a bit under the weather, I better take some medicine so I can prevent myself from getting worse, right? Okay, all right, so that's to feel a bit under the weather. The next one we have here is actually on the back side and it is ah, one that I like, hit the sack, hit the hay, or hit the sack, hit the hay, or hit the sheets. But sheets, I don't really like that one. Sack and hay, that's much better. So that one just means to go to bed, right? Hey guys, I'm really tired, I'm gonna hit the sack, right? Or hey guys, I'm feeling sleepy, I'm gonna hit the hay. So yeah, that could be our example, right? Uh, dude, maybe you have a roommate and it's a guy, right? You're like, dude, I feel super tired. Feel super tired, dude. So I'm gonna hit the sack. And there we go. Hooray. Okie dokie. So hit the sack, hit the hay. Good one. Um, uh, further on down here, what were the other ones we looked at? Uh, wait, just a second guys. I hope I didn't skip one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, ah, yeah, sorry, miss, to miss the boat, which I really do like, and I do use this expression pretty often. To miss uh, the boat, and to miss the boat meant to say that somebody has missed an opportunity, somebody has missed a chance at something, right? To miss an opportunity or chance. 
right? So let's think of a good example here, right? Um, you should have, maybe somebody applied for a job and they got it at a certain company, but then they declined the job because, I don't know, they were too busy or something else was going on in their lives, so they declined it. But, you know, they would have been really good for that job. So you're like, man, you should have taken that job in New York. You really missed the boat, right? And that is just too bad. All right, guys, maybe let's try to take a look at one more really quickly before the break, then we'll look at the other two after the break. So one second, miss the boat. Oh, there's so many good expressions here. Um, oh yeah, on the ball. To be on the ball. And the explanation here is when somebody understands the situation well, yeah, sure, but I would say a better explanation is um, to be very competent, like to be good at your job, right? Um, so if you usually, like if you say this to somebody, like, wow, you're really on the ball, it's definitely a nice thing to say. It is a compliment, right? You're saying, wow, you're good at your job or you work quickly, you work effectively, you are on the ball. Uh, boom, 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 boom. So what I want to say, our server is really on the ball today. Like she is a good server and she is really good at her job. Okay guys, uh, but I think what we need to do is to take a break for 10 minutes, right? Because we're almost at the break right now. So let's take a break for 10 minutes. And when we come back, I think we just have, wait, let me think here. One, two, three, four. Actually, I think we just have that one other expression to look at. And then I think we're basically done um, with the idioms for today. So after that, we'll do our speaking practice and we should be good. And then in our third class, we'll talk about happiness a little bit and listen to that very popular song about five years ago. Five years ago? Something like that. Anyhow, let's take a break. See you later.
Hey guys, welcome back to Live PST. We are now in our second class and we are just continuing with our idiom sheet just for one more idiom. And that idiom is, now on the sheet it says, sit on the fence. But usually we don't say sit on the fence, we say to be on the fence. And to be on the fence basically means to be undecided. So you're not sure about which side of an issue you belong on, right? You don't know if you support John or if you support Sally. You're just really not sure. Now, the explanation here is, this is used when someone does not want to choose or make a, a decision. Yeah, that's basically correct, right? So if you say, I'm on the fence, you're saying you cannot choose between two or more options, right? Or you cannot support this person over the other person, you just don't know. You're being indecisive, right? Which is also a good word, but anyhow. Um, so you might say something like, you know, I can't choose between the pizza and the I don't know, uh, the, what else can we eat? And the pasta. I can't choose between them. I am on the fence. I'm on the fence. I can't choose between the pizza and the pasta. I got no idea, right? Anyhow, so that is the meaning of to be on the fence. All right, guys. So. We went over the idioms that we looked at yesterday, actually. I hope these idioms are something that you guys can use. They're kind of fun, they're pretty good, but also the rest of that list there is also really, really good. There are a few that I'm like, mm, I don't use them so often, but actually most of them are really excellent. So I highly recommend if you do have extra time and you do want to study something, go over this list here because these are excellent. So. Anyhow, guys, we are supposed to move on and do some speaking practice. So if you guys could take a look at this sheet here, and this sheet says speaking practice, questions relating to superlative stories, that would be great. Now, we have five questions each, one for superlative form and one for the comparative form. And speaking practice in an online class is always a little bit weird because it just means that I'm going to talk, 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 but it seems like I'm talking a lot anyhow. But what we'll do is we'll look at each question and I will try to model an answer and possibly write down an example answer on the board. So let's take a look here, guys. Um, our question here is, what is the most difficult thing about studying English? Oh, okay. For example, grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, spelling, reading, listening, writing, etc. Okay, guys, now obviously this is a great question for you guys. You know, if you're studying English, and of course you are if you're watching this, um, for everybody, there's going to be different aspects of the language that are difficult for them, right? So maybe for somebody, it's going to be pronunciation, for other people, it's going to be I don't know, grammar, for others it'll be vocab and spelling or reading or listening or whatever it is, right? But I think I have a pretty good opinion too. Of course, I am a native English speaker, but I've been a teacher for a long time and I've seen how students have struggled with certain aspects of the English language. And in my opinion, the most difficult thing about studying English is probably pronunciation and the difference between spelling and sound in English, right? So, in my humble opinion, I believe that the most difficult part 
or aspect of studying English is pronunciation. And to expand further on that, I'd say the difference between sounds and spelling in English is quite frustrating. for many students. Now, I know a lot of people, like, of course, Canada is a country of immigrants, right? And I live in Vancouver, which is one of the main ports of destination or arrival for immigrants in Canada. Like, um, there's a, a large percentage of the population in Vancouver are people who have immigrated, whether that was 20 years ago or two years ago. And I'll meet people from China, India, Philippines, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Chile, Ecuador, you know, whatever. And sometimes their, their English will be actually quite good. Like their grammar is good. It's on point. They know how to use vocabulary. They're really, really good. But one problem that seems to always pop up, even with people who are quite fluent in English, is errors with pronunciation, right? Because learning correct English pronunciation takes a long time. And one of the things that's really difficult about it, of course, is that sometimes spelling and sound don't really match very well in English, right? Think about words like, you know, island, for example. The first time you read this word, you say island, right? Because, of course, you've got I-S and an L-A-N-D. Looks like island. Bam! You're wrong, it's island, right? There are so many exceptions to pronunciation rules in English. Now, a lot of people think that there aren't a lot of rules when it comes to pronouncing words correctly in English. Actually, you, you're wrong. There are 200 plus rules when it comes to pronunciation in English. So there are rules, but the problem is there are just too many rules. If somebody wanted to learn all 200 plus rules, it would take too long. So a lot of English teachers, when they're teaching English to their students, they don't focus on pronunciation rules too much because honestly, it's a waste of time. So a lot of people believe that unfortunately, when it comes to learning pronunciation, is just something you're gonna have to pick up naturally over time. However, that being said, like, I've met people who have been here for 20 years, right? And their use of English is almost perfect. Almost perfect. But sometimes they'll mispronounce something, right? In my opinion, the second biggest problem or second most difficult issue when learning English is grammar. Because English grammar is, yeah, fairly complex. Of course, grammar in other languages as well. But pronunciation is, in my opinion, the number one biggest problem when learning English. It just takes a really long time. And to be honest, to master English pronunciation is really hard. If somebody who is an immigrant comes here and does master English and they're completely fluent and their pronunciation is great, that is actually a huge accomplishment. I, I would be in awe of them. I'd be like, wow, really? Like, your pronunciation is on point? Like, that's tough. It is not easy. So, in my opinion, as a teacher, it is definitely pronunciation. However, your opinion as a student, I don't know. Maybe pronunciation is not a big issue for you. Maybe it's English vocabulary or grammar or something else. Okay, next question we have here is, what is the most exciting game or sport you've ever tried? Oh. That's a good question. Hmm, what is the most exciting? Hmm. I don't know, I have to think back. I don't play any sports these days during the age of corona. 
Um, I think for me, yeah, for me, the most exciting sport or activity is skiing. Now, a lot of people these days, like when I was younger, skiing was very popular and then suddenly snowboarding became super popular and everybody wanted to snowboard and blah, blah, blah. So I also tried snowboarding as well. And yeah, it's fun. But actually, I prefer skiing. And the reason why is because when you're skiing, you can go a lot faster than a snowboarder. Like if you're going downhill, you can start crouching over and you can pick up a lot of speed. Um, so, and also skiing in my hometown is really, really awesome. Uh, we do have, compared to like Whistler, which is one of the best ski hills in the world, probably the best ski hill in the world actually, uh, my hometown ski hill is pretty small in comparison, but there's about 20 different runs and it only costs about $20 if you have your own equipment. So you can go skiing for the whole day from like, you know, morning till three or four o'clock and it's pretty awesome. So da, 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 da. yeah, I would say the reason why is because you can go really fast. I know that's kind of a lame reason, but also in my hometown, like there, like the runs are like the lanes for skiing, right? In between the runs, of course, there's a forested area, but we used to go on trails in between the runs, which is like a little bit dangerous, but um, it was actually like a lot of fun. I always imagine, like, I, I'd really like to hear from a Japanese student, um, like, if you like skiing, how do you say that in Japanese? Because I know like in Japanese is like ski, right? So I guess in Japanese you say ski ga ski, right? I like skiing. Watashi wa ski ga ski. It sounds kind of funny though, right? Ski ga ski. Anyhow, bad joke. Let's move on. So for me though, skiing. However, there's lots of other activities I've done which are also interesting. I, I also really liked um, water skiing, which I did do before. Uh, with my cousins who live on Vancouver Island. You know, you are towed by a boat and you hold on and you kind of ski around in the water. That's a lot of fun. Um, other fun, I really liked playing lacrosse in uh, gym class when I was in high school. Lacrosse is actually, like a lot of people when they think of Canada's national sport, they often think that it is hockey, which of course is a good guess. Hockey is Canada's most popular sport by far. That is true. However, Canada's national sport is actually a sport called lacrosse. And a lot of people don't know what lacrosse is. Lacrosse is actually really, really exciting. But lacrosse is, you know, it's a team sport. So it's similar to like, you know, soccer, basketball, whatever in that aspect. I think more similar to soccer. I think you have like 10 players on both sides. It's hard to remember because I played it in high school, but I haven't played it since. Um, and then everybody has a position, of course, and you wear some protective gear, like you have kind of like a helmet and some shoulder pads and stuff like that. But you also have this like stick with a little hoop or net, and then you have a ball and you can kind of like throw it at people and try to catch it in the, in the net with your stick and then try to throw it into the other team's net. And it's really, really fun, super fast, and can be pretty violent. So I think lacrosse is a really, really underrated sport. Uh, more people should play lacrosse because it's actually a lot of fun. Anyhow, number three, what restaurant has the most delicious food you've ever eaten? Hmm, mm, 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 hmm. Um, in my opinion, there was a restaurant in Seoul, South Korea, that had 
the most delicious food that I have ever eaten. Okay, so for me, there was this one restaurant in Seoul, uh, South Korea, that had the most delicious food that I've ever eaten. They served the best samgyeopsal, or basically pork belly, I have ever had. So if you're from Brazil, South America, Africa, Europe, whatever, um, I highly recommend trying out Korean food. It's really good, usually pretty healthy, not always, but pretty good. Um, and there's this one dish which is very popular in Korea. Most Koreans really like it. It's called Samgyeopsal, and that is kind of a pork belly dish. And if you go to a Samgyeopsal restaurant, you will grill it and then you will wrap it in lettuce and maybe mix in some salt, some rice, and maybe some veggie mix. And then you will eat it and it's just it's really, really good. And it's kind of fun to go there with friends because you can grill the food together with your good friends and then you'll drink something called soju, which is a fairly strong liquor um, or spirit and yeah, you'll have like a really awesome time. But yeah, there was this one specific uh, pork belly restaurant in Seoul, South Korea that I really, really liked. Um, it was just the best one I ever went to. I don't know if it exists anymore because I was there kind of a long time ago. That's about 11 years ago now. Oh my God, I'm getting old. Uh, but if I ever had a chance, I would definitely try to go back there and have it again. It's just super delicious. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, in general, Korea has really good food. And for reasonable prices compared to Vancouver. Restaurants in Vancouver are pretty good. The main advantage of restaurants in Vancouver is that there's a lot of variety because there's so many people from different countries here. So if you want pretty good Indian food, you can get pretty good Indian food or Japanese or Korean or Vietnamese or French, or Italian, or whatever, American. Um, but in my opinion, there is no really awesome restaurants in Vancouver. There's just a lot of pretty good restaurants, and the prices are actually not that bad, because I used to think they were really expensive. But after I traveled to Europe, um, after going to like France, the Netherlands, and Italy, you know, and paying for food there, then you realize, like, oh my God, eating out in France or Italy is quite horribly expensive, especially France, like really, really expensive. And the quality was like, yeah, it's pretty good, but I didn't have anything like super great. Um, so I'd say Vancouver, in my opinion, I'm sorry, is better than Paris. Uh, but Korea, pretty cheap food is really good. The only problem is there's not as much variety, but it's pretty good stuff. Anyhow, where is the best place to go on a vacation in your country? What's the most appropriate souvenir to bring back from there? Ugh, that's kind of a hard question. Ugh. Where's the best place to go on vacation in Canada? Blah. Mm. Okay, I'm really on the fence here because actually there are two places that I highly recommend. Um, okay, so I'm going to add an if statement. If you enjoy nature, the best place to go on a vacation to in Canada is the Rocky Mountains. They are extremely beautiful. So the Rocky Mountains are on the border of British Columbia and Alberta, which are two different provinces in Canada. 
if you like nature. The Rocky Mountains are really, really stunning. They're stunningly beautiful. It will impress you. It's just like kind of magical and beautiful. So highly recommend the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but O-T-O-H, which means on the other hand, if you prefer cities and a good nightlife, and of course nightlife means things you can do at night, like going to bars or theaters or uh, pubs or whatever, clubs, um, that's all included in nightlife. And a good nightlife, you must go to Montreal. Um, Vancouver, in comparison, has actually, I would say, not a very good nightlife. Like, yes, there are bars and pubs. They're not really that exciting. They're kind of expensive. It's expensive to go out in Vancouver. Um, but yeah, they're not really that great. Um, and I think it's just Canadian people in Vancouver are not super exciting people. They're not super outgoing. So it kind of sucks in Vancouver. But Montreal is super awesome, right? Because they have that aspect of French culture, right? So they got good wine, they got good food. Um, they're more joyful as a people. So yeah, you got to go to Montreal because you want to see the food, you want to experience the nightlife. It's really good. Um, the main reason, duh, 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 duh. Eh, you must go to Montreal. Montreal is very exciting and unique in comparison to the rest of Canada. Um, so yeah, uh, now a good souvenir to buy, a good souvenir to buy is not exactly from the Rocky Mountains or Montreal, but more from my province, from British Columbia, is smoked salmon. If you can find smoked salmon, it's really good, it's delicious, um, and they definitely, if you give this to your parents or older people, I don't know why, but older people seem to really, really love it, I highly recommend getting smoked salmon as a souvenir. Anyhow, let's take a look at number five. Who is the most attractive celebrity in your country? How about internationally? What? Who is the most attractive celebrity in your country? How about internationally? So, who is the most attractive Canadian celebrity? And internationally, who is the most attractive celebrity? Ah, I don't know. Um, okay, the most attractive celebrity. Okay, now actually, not in Canada, because like if you're a really good actor, singer, entertainer, whatever in Canada, if you're really good, you will always go to the United States without an exception, right? Because like, yeah, in Canada, you can get pretty good money if you're, you know, a popular actor or singer, that's true, but you can get 10 times more money if you're really good and you go to the United States. So like all good Canadian actors and actresses will go to the United States if they can, right? And like a lot of people don't know this, but there are a lot of Canadian actors in Hollywood and in Hollywood movies, right? And sometimes people don't know, but of course people like Jim Carrey, the very popular comedic actor, um, he doesn't act so much anymore, but he was in a lot of comedies before. He's Canadian, of course. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Ah, there are just so many, but I, wow, I'm really drawing a blank here. But I think, the most attractive Canadian celebrity. I'm actually going to give it to a guy. I know it's weird because I usually don't think about guys' looks, but most attractive celebrity from Canada is Ryan Gosling. And even a lot of people don't know that Ryan Gosling is attractive. Now, actually, I think for a lot of women out there, if you're from Asia or South America, actually, maybe Ryan Gosling isn't really that good looking to you. But for like a lot of white women in Canada and America, he's 
he's like really well known as being like an attractive dude. Um, and he's a good actor, so I respect him. For being attractive, eh, I don't care, right? I don't play for that baseball team. I play for the other baseball team, not the baseball team that would find Go Ryan Gosling attractive. But he's a cool dude. And I think he's probably Canada's most popular actor right now in the United States, so Ryan Gosling. Um, internationally, internationally, in my opinion, the most attractive celebrity is, oh God, I don't know, who is a really attractive celebrity? I don't watch a lot of movies these days, but um, yeah, the most attractive celebrity in the world right now. Okay, I'm gonna go for a younger one. I think she's about 30. I think her name is Anna, Anna de Armas. I could be wrong with the spelling here. She's relatively new, or at least I don't really know her very well, but I think she's actually originally from Cuba and then she moved to the United States. But yeah, she is extremely attractive, good looking lady, seems to be nice and a good actress, so I respect her. Okay, so Ryan Gosling for Canada and Anna de Armas for internationally. Anyhow, all right guys, so we got all our superlative questions done. Let's take a look at our comparatives. Um, now the comparatives, we have five questions here as well. So let me draw a little line. Maybe I could write the first one down here. Um, do you think technology has made the world better or worse? Blech. Um, the answer for me is pretty simple. I'd say better. I think that technology has made the world better. Okay, now I could write down a ton of reasons, but I prefer not to. I think I'm just going to talk about it. Um, so, of course, the Industrial Revolution, this could be really boring. Before the Industrial Revolution, of course, most people, 95% of the world's population is extremely poor, you know, working on a farm, barely making enough food to live. Um, and then the Industrial Revolution got started and people were still poor. But getting into, you know, the aftermath of World War II from the late 40s until the current day, people are far richer than they used to be. Um, and a big part of that is technology. People can get a car, people can get a phone, people can get a computer, people can get an apartment, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of that is because of technology. Of course, the negative side of it is that producing a technology has created pollution and that's causing global warming and that's a problem. Now if we wanted to stop global warming we just completely stop using technology but then of course so many people are going to die because technology is really important for medicine, right? And things like fighting cancer or fighting diseases or fighting the coronavirus depends on technology and depends on a lot of medical technology. So. In my opinion, technology is really important, but I hope in the future that we are able to develop technology to help clean up the planet, right? Anyhow, so that's my answer for number one. I think for sure technology has made the world a much better place. Like, I know a lot of people in Canada, and it's kind of true in Canada and the United States when people say, oh, things are not as good now as they were in the past. Like, a lot of people my age, when they think of their parents' generation, they can see that their parents' generation were better off. They made more money in comparison, right? And it doesn't seem fair. However, compared to the rest of the world, the rest of the world has also really caught up in the past you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So we're actually living in a time when people are richer than they have ever been. People are healthier than they have ever been. People are safer than they have ever been. We're actually, despite people like Donald Trump or Putin or Xi Jinping or whatever, we're actually living in one of the best times in history. And I think people should acknowledge that because it is true. Anyhow, number two, if you own a business, is it more important to be good with numbers or is it more important to be creative? Okay, I don't own a business, so this is hard for me to answer. 
Um, if you guys own a business, I'd really like to hear from you. Um, so which is it? Is it more important to be good with numbers or is it more important to be creative? Hmm. Uh, in my humble opinion, because I'm not a business owner, but I think it would be more important to be creative. Um, that's just my opinion. I think it is more important to be creative because you want or you should want you should want to create attractive and create well let's say innovative I don't want to use creative again and innovative products or services in order to get customers. Like I think initially when you start, you know, a business, like, you know, you don't want to just start something that everybody else is doing, right? Then maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you'll just do okay, right? But if you're creative, if you've got a great idea for a new product, a new restaurant, a new kind of food, or a new kind of machine, or a different way of doing a certain service, like, I think initially that's important for attracting people um, and getting customers in the door and getting them to purchase your product or purchase your services, right? Uh, being good with numbers, of course, I believe that's also important. It's good to be able to analyze your business, find out what aspects are making money and what things are costing you too much, and then finding out how can you save money on those things, right? But let's take a look at the next question. Okay, number three here says, which do you think does more damage to your health, smoking or drinking? Okay, this is a good question for me <clears throat> because unfortunately I am a smoker. Smoking is terrible. You should not smoke. That's awful, right? Um, I'm not an alcoholic, but I do drink occasionally. I have two kids. I think I've only had a few drinks since my second daughter has been born. So I'm not like a big drinker. I don't drink too often. Um, but I know people who drink too much. Um, in my opinion, in my opinion, I think drinking alcohol is far more destructive. or worse than smoking. Smoking, of course, is really bad, but in my opinion, I think drinking alcohol, if you become an alcoholic, I think it's really, really bad for you, right? Um, alcoholics, whoops, alcoholics hurt their families lose their jobs etc like not all the time there's lots of functional alcoholics but um, yeah alcoholics like sometimes they just drink too much and it screws up their job and then they lose their job and that hurts their family or it hurts themselves um, they hurt their like if they have kids you know they might be emotionally abusive to them maybe even physically abusive when they're drunk um, I th yeah like there's a lot unfortunately there's a very high level of alcoholism in my hometown um, so I could see the effects of alcoholism it just tends to hurt people a lot so in my opinion both are very bad whether you're smoking or drinking too much both are very very negative but in my opinion yeah, I think drinking alcohol is far, far worse. It does a lot of damage, right? And it's just, it's unhealthy and it hurts people. Okay, guys, but I can't really talk about that anymore. So let's look at the fourth question. I'm a little bit worried that I'm going a little bit too quickly here. But the fourth question says, when it comes to phones, which product is more popular among people in your country, Apple or Android? 
Okay, that's like actually a really hard question. Um, in Canada, um, which kind of phones are more popular, Apple or Android? I think in Canada, or in Canada's case, they are tied. And what I mean there is, it's, it, I think it's about 50-50. I could really be wrong here, but I think it's about 50-50. Maybe Android has a slight edge. Eh, no, actually, I don't want to say that. I don't think that's true. It's about 50-50, in my opinion. Yeah, it's about 50-50. Yeah, it's about 50-50, I guess. Um, however, I'd say Apple is generally more popular and well-known for reliability and durability, but it is, whoops, it is also quite expensive as well, right? Um, so I think like, yeah, uh, Apple phones are generally much more expensive than Android phones, not all the time. I think there are some that are pricier than Apple phones, but they're well known for, like, they're just more popular, they look good, they look sleek, um, and they also have a good reputation for being durable and reliable. My wife uses Apple phones, I use Android phones, but my wife had an, I think it was a iPhone 4S, and she had that thing for like four years, and the only reason we had to get her a new phone was because she left it in her back pocket of her pants, and then we put it into the washer because we were doing laundry. And of course, when we took it out, the phone was dead, right? Um, if that had not happened, you know, she would have continued to use that phone for another year or two. So yeah, Apple phones, like the durability and reliability of them is extremely good. Um, I use Android, but I've gone through a couple of different Android phones and I had an a long time ago, I had an Android or like a Galaxy S2, and it was a good phone. Um, I got it on a two-year contract. It was a good phone for about a year, but after only one year, it started slowing down, and there were problems with it, and I had to get a new phone in less than two years, only like a year and a couple of months. So after that, I was like, and I'm sorry if you're Korean, but I was like, mm, Samsung, I just don't trust them. Like, I, I don't think they're as durable or reliable. It's powerful and it's cool. It has good features, but they're not reliable, right? So I decided I'm not going to buy Samsung anymore. So then I tried Sony, of course, from Japan. And my Sony phone was like, all right. But again, it wasn't like really super awesome or anything. It was just okay. And then after that, I tried Motorola. And actually, I really liked my Motorola phone. I had like a premium budget Motorola phone, but it was actually like really, really good and super cheap. And it could do all the same things as any other phone. And then most recently, because I have kids, I decided, okay, I'm going to get a phone with a good camera. So I got a Google Pixel phone because, you know, it's got a good camera. And it does have a good camera, but the problem is, I wanted the phone to take good pictures of my kids and then send them to my mom or other family members. But the problem is when I send the image in a text, it compresses the image and the image looks like garbage. So to be honest, I'm pretty disappointed with the Google phone. So I think when my contract for this phone is done, I am not going to get a Google based phone again. I am going to switch to something else. Who knows? Maybe I'll switch to Apple. There's something about Apple that I don't really like. I guess I don't like Apple phones because I feel like, oh, everybody buys them because they think they're cool or something. And I'm like, oh, I want to be different, right? But maybe that's stupid. I should probably just get an Apple phone. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's me. Anyhow, guys, let's take a look at the last question here. I'm not sure how much I can talk about it. And we're almost, well, 10 minutes away from a break here. But our last question is, what things are you personally better at or more talented in than your friends or family members? Ugh. Now, this sounds like a real show-off question, right? Like, oh, I'm better at everything than my family members or friends. Uh, huh. Who am I comparing myself to? And what am I better at? Uh, huh. I think when it comes to trivia, I am more knowledgeable than the majority of my friends and family members. Now, you guys probably don't know what trivia is. Trivia is not really important. Trivia, the reason why it's called trivia is because it's coming from the adjective trivial. And trivial, which is a good adjective, means like unimportant. Uh, but I really like trivia contests. And those are contests where they ask you questions from like history or science or uh, movies and then you try to answer the question and if you get it right maybe you get a prize or something. I'm really good at trivia. Um, if you ever watch Jeopardy in the United States or Canada they ask a lot of questions related to history and I really enjoy that. I'm pretty good at it. I think I'm pretty knowledgeable when it comes to history so I'm very good at trivia. However my older brother is also really good. I think I'm a little bit better than him though so I think when it comes to trivia, I'm more knowledgeable than the majority of my friends and family members. Um, also, I believe I am better at, hmm, can't really think of anything like terribly important. Uh, yeah, what am I better at? What am I better at? Uh, hmm. I'm better at, this is really hard to explain, I'm better at gauging people's intentions. Um, I think because of my job and the kind of person I am, of course, as a teacher, I've met many different kinds of people. I've traveled to a lot of different countries. Um, I'm pretty good at gauging or guessing people's intentions, like, and noticing, like, okay, this person is a nice person, uh, you know, whatever, but this person is a bad person, we should stay away from them. I think I'm better at that than most people. Um, not just my family members, but most people. Oh, wow, good for me. Um, I am also better at languages than my family members. Okay, but yeah, that's about it. It's not like I'm trying to brag here or something like that. Like, whoa, I'm so good at this, right? Uh, my family members, there are many things that they're better at than me when it comes to things, right? So anyhow, guys, um, as I said before, the speaking practice is always kind of weird. Looks like we're about done. There are lots of interesting questions here. What I think you guys should do is try to find a partner, whether that's your roommate, wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, yada yada, um, or your dog that speaks English fairly well, and find a partner and ask and answer these questions back and forth. Like These are pretty good questions. Some of them are a little bit tricky. Um, they're more complicated than you think. So I think they're actually pretty fun. Um, so yeah. I think we'll stop it there with that one. And guys, we can kind of start to get into the third class of material now because there is actually a lot of stuff here. Uh, ba, ba, da, ba, ba. And this is, whoop. okay, where do I have this here? 
Oh, OK. And we're doing two things, actually, in the third class. We are listening to a song called Happy by Pharrell Williams. You've probably heard this song before. And we're going to be taking a look at this happiness sheet, where we're going to look at some uh, expressions here and then go over some conversation questions. We're going to do this one first. So maybe before we take a break here, because it looks like we got a few minutes, let's look at some of the expressions at the top here with uh, this happiness conversation sheet. Let's take a quick look. Um, so happiness at the top. And it says, oh, the first one is a good expression. Now, these expressions are useful. They are good. But remember, this is not going to be on your quiz. So don't worry about these ones too much. But the first one is to be on, whoops, what am I doing here? To be on cloud nine. To be on cloud nine. The meaning of to be on cloud nine just means to be extremely happy. So usually we use this when we're talking about the past and a time in the past when we were really happy, right? So you'd say something like, Oh, I was on cloud nine when, and then you think of some happy experience of yours, right? So I was on cloud nine when I, hmm, I proposed to my wife. And she said, yes. Ugh, how cheesy, right? Uh, but yeah, no, it's true. When I proposed to my wife and she said, yes, of course, I was really, really happy, right? And then after that, everything has just gone downhill. Ha, 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 ha. But actually, that's probably similar to a lot of guys out there. So anyhow. To be on cloud nine, it is a good expression. I'm on cloud nine, he's on cloud nine, they're on cloud nine, like they're just really happy. I'm on cloud nine whenever this happens, or I'm on cloud nine when that happens, right? This is a good expression. So, but guys, let's stop there with to be on cloud nine. After the break, we'll take a look at happy camper, happy go lucky person, music to my ears, and snug as a rug in a bug. Blah, snug as a bug in a rug. And then we'll look at some questions here and we'll talk about the happy song from Pharrell Williams. And it should be pretty good. All right, guys, so let's take a break for about 10 minutes. And then we will get into a happy topic. It'll be really happy time. We'll just be super happy together. And we'll see how it goes. OK, guys, but yeah, I'll take a break. I will see you guys again in about 10 minutes. Okay.
Welcome back to Live PST, everybody. Um, we are now in our third class on Friday, so of course, we're going to be going over a quick discussion topic and then do some music listening. So it should be lots of fun. And we already went over the first expression on the discussion topic. So that discussion topic was just, you know, the title is happiness. And then we have five different expressions or idioms. And we just took a look at to be on cloud nine, which just means to be very happy. And the second expression we're looking at today is similar to being on cloud nine. It is to be a happy camper. Now basically it has the same meaning, but if you look at the meaning here, it says to be content or to be satisfied. So when you're satisfied or content, it's not exactly the same thing as being happy, right? When you're happy, you're like, eh. If you're content, you're like, you know, yeah, this is, this is good, right? Anyhow, so that's the difference there. But the example we have here is, ah, I love eating pizza on Saturday nights. I'm a happy camper if I can just eat pizza and watch hockey. All right, so obviously this is some kind of Canadian person talking because um, in the winter time, well, fall or winter when the hockey season is on, everybody loves to watch hockey on a Saturday night. And if they have pizza along with it, wow, that's just a really great night. I would also be a happy camper. For me, um, if my kid, like let's say my younger daughter Lila, if she is sleeping and she looks happy, and if my older daughter Mira is calm and playing games by herself, and my wife seems happy, I am a happy camper, right? As long as my family members look like they're happy or satisfied, I'm going to be a happy camper too, because then everything will be nice and calm, right? But if my kids are screaming and crying because, I don't know, maybe my older daughter wanted blueberries, but we didn't give her blueberries. I don't know why she really loves blueberries. And my younger daughter needs to be fed, so she's crying. Then I definitely will not be a happy camper. But my example here, uh, hmm, maybe I'd say, yeah, whenever my wife and kids are happy or content, I am a happy camper. And that's about it. So yeah, um, both of those expressions are good. They are kind of similar to be on cloud nine and to be a happy camper. But one of them is more about being extremely happy. And the other one is just about being satisfied and or content. Okay, so let's take a look at the next one, guys. We have a happy go lucky person. A happy go lucky person. Now, a happy go lucky person, this is not complicated at all. It's just a person who is generally or usually easy going and happy. So if you know someone in your life, whether that's a friend or family member, and they're like a really easygoing person, like they don't worry too much, they're not very stressed out, they're always like, hey dude, how's it going? Like, oh yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Like they always seem like, you know, satisfied or happy and they're easygoing, they're not stressed out. Then you can call that person a happy-go-lucky guy, a happy-go-lucky girl, right? The example we have here is overall, I'm pretty happy-go-lucky. Not much upsets me. And that's not bad. Uh, my example is, yeah, maybe from my friend. My good friend, Matt, is a really happy, go lucky guy. 
he never gets stressed and he is usually happy. So yeah, my good friend Matt from my hometown, he's a pretty happy guy, never really seems to get very stressed out. Of course he does sometimes, everybody gets stressed out, right? But he's usually not stressed, he's pretty easy going. Yeah, he's a happy-go-lucky guy. Okay guys, so we got cloud nine, to be on cloud nine, to be a happy camper and a happy-go-lucky person. But we got two more here, so let me erase the board here for a second. And let's take a look at the two other expressions. Okay, ah, next one, pretty good. Music to my ears. Now, usually we say that is music to my ears, right? So let me modify this just a little bit. That is, or that's music to my ears. If something is music to your ears, it basically means something sounds great, right? Something sounds great. And that's usually a suggestion. Okay, so the way we use this is like usually somebody like makes a suggestion about what they want to do with you and you agree with it and you say, hey, that's music to my ears. Like that sounds like a great idea, right? Um, and it says here, yeah, like great news or something that makes you happy. Um, so the example here is like, it's good. Monday is a holiday. That's music to my ears, right? Maybe this person forgot that Monday's a holiday and then they're suddenly reminded, right? Like, oh yeah, Monday's a holiday. Oh man, that's music to my ears. That's great to hear. I'm so happy to hear that. Or let's say for example, uh, somebody says, you want to go to Five Guys? That is music to my ears, right? So Five Guys Restaurant, the American hamburger chain, it's really good. So anyhow, yeah, you want to, like, so maybe somebody says, hey, hey man, you want to go to Five Guys? And you're like, you want to go to Five Guys? That's music to my ears, dude. Let's go to Five Guys. Like, that sounds good to me, right? Okay, and that's all the meaning, or that's what that means. It's a really good expression. I like it. Okay, actually, all the expressions here are really good. Last one is something I don't use very often, but it, it's not bad. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, to be snug as a bug in a rug. So it sounds kind of funny, right? Um, and it basically means to be very comfortable. Be very comfortable, usually wrapped in a blanket. Okay, so if you say, I am as snug as a bug in a rug, you're saying like, man, I feel really, really comfortable. Maybe you have like a blanket around you and it's nice and warm and you're gonna go to sleep soon. And you're like, man, I'm as snug as a bug in a rug. Like I, I feel great, right? Um, so the example here, <clears throat> the person says, I curled up in a blanket in front of the fireplace and I was just snug as a bug in a rug, right? Um, this is, again, an expression I don't use very often, but when I think somebody like looks really comfortable, like they're wrapped up in a blanket in a warm place, and they look like content and happy, then I might use this expression. I might be like, oh yeah, he looks as snug as a bug in a rug, right? Um, but I could also use this to talk about 
my daughters now. So when my younger daughter Lila is sleeping in her bassinet wrapped in her blanket. She looks as snug as a bug in a rug. So you know how it is when you have like a young baby and you have them really tightly wrapped up in a blanket and they look happy and they're sleeping. You know when they're sleeping and they're kind of like smiling at the same time and they just look really content and happy. They look as snug as a bug in a rug, don't they? I think they do. All right guys, so that does it for our expression. So the only one that I think is a bit weaker is to be as snug as a bug in a rug. The other ones like that's music to my ears or happy go lucky person or happy camper or to be on cloud nine. Those are all really good expressions that are worth picking up. The last one is just not as commonly used, but they're all pretty good. So I hope you guys can learn them and try to use them in your English and try to use them on a daily basis because it's useful if you can pick these up. People will think you sound more fluent. Okay, but let's just take a quick look, maybe not quick look, let's take a look at some of these conversation questions and I'll just kind of model an answer and then we're going to listen to the song. Uh, but, ooh, some of these questions are not very easy. How do you know when you are happy? How do you know when you are happy? Hmm, that's a tough question. How do I know when I'm happy? Okay, well, for me, I know when I'm happy when I'm kind of smiling and I'm not consciously smiling. I'm not controlling it myself, right? I know I'm kind of happy when my kids are, like I said before, when my kids are quiet and satisfied or happy themselves and when my wife looks okay. That's when I know I'm happy. That's when I can kind of calm down for a little bit, right? What do you notice about yourself when you're happy? Hmm, I notice that I feel much more relaxed, right? And I'm less on edge. I'm not like super alert and like ready to like run out and grab something or like uh, something like that. Uh, do you do things differently when you're happy? Probably, yeah. When I'm happy, like even if I have to do annoying tasks around the house, like I don't know, do the dishes or vacuum, I don't feel so sluggish, right? And sluggish means like a slug. A slug is, you know, that kind of disgusting looking uh, insect. But basically sluggish means slow or like unwilling to do something. But when I'm happy and I have to do, I don't know, chores around the house, the dishes, the vacuuming, uh, laundry, whatever. Yeah, when I'm happy, it's totally fine. I don't feel sluggish. I can do it effectively. Are you more active? Definitely yes. When I am happy, I feel more active. I feel like I have more energy. I feel, how can I say, uh, more energized, right? I don't feel tired anymore. Do you spend more time doing things for others? Yeah, probably. Like when I'm happy, like I'll try to play more with my kids if they're awake and, you know, wanting to play or like hang out with my wife and have like a nice time together or something like that. Mm, do you feel physically different when you're happy? Yeah, like I said before, I'll feel more energized and yeah, I just feel more relaxed as well. What is the smallest, simplest thing that's ever made you happy? I don't know, like that's hard to remember. Like I'm sure there's been lots of things, but yeah, like if a family member of mine sends me a picture from a long time ago and that happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, my brother sent me a picture uh, that was taken when my brothers and I were really young and he had suddenly gotten a copy of this picture and he texted it to me. And when I saw that picture, I was, I was really happy. Like that's something small and simple, right? Just a picture of us from 
the, I think it would have been like 1994 or 95. I'm pretty old. So anyhow, um, he sent us this picture and I was like, yeah, that made me happy. It was like, oh, I could remember being a kid and, you know, spending time with my brothers. Uh, why do you think you reacted that way? Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, probably because of nostalgia, right? Um, and nostalgia is a good word. Nostalgia, um, which is the noun, and nostalgic, which is the adjective. Nostalgia is like a very fond memory of the past. And nostalgic is the adjective form. Usually nostalgia, like this very fond memory, this very good memory of the past, it, is, it usually comes from something visual that you see that reminds you of the past, or maybe something you smell that reminds me you of some smell that you experienced in the past, or you listen to a song and it's from your childhood and it rem reminds you of you know, being at home and having fun with your family or friends or in school or whatever. Uh, or it could be a movie um, that really reminds you of the past. And usually nostalgic feelings uh, make us feel kind of warm and nice. So when I received that picture from my brother, I think I had this kind of nostalgic memory of the past, right? I just remembered like, oh yeah, I remember playing with my brothers in the forest near our house and like, Oh, it was fun, right? What is the happiest moment you've ever had in your life? What made it so wonderful? These questions are actually really hard for me um, because I guess I'm a guy and, you know, we're not really... I wasn't raised to talk too much about my emotions except for anger or... Yeah, except for anger. Um, we don't really talk about happiness, so honestly, these are really hard. What's the happiest moment you've ever had? Um, like I said before, I guess when I proposed to my wife and she said yes and we could get married, I guess that was the happiest moment in my life, but no, 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 no. Uh, my wife and I had a small wedding in Vancouver and then later we, my wife is Japanese, so we had a wedding in Japan. I, no, I'm not really a wedding kind of guy, but um, the wedding in Japan was actually really good and I think that's probably one of the happiest moments in my life uh, but I think I was really happy because not all my family members could come but my sister and my mother came and they got along really well with my mother-in-law, father-in-law and sisters-in-law, my wife's family and I was just really happy that they could get along together and yeah, that just made me feel like I was on cloud nine. I felt really good about that. So that was good. It was wonderful. Um, also, just the wedding itself, of course, was really nice. It's very extravagant, good food. Um, and also, actually, another really great thing about my wedding is I had invited two friends uh, from Japan, these two Japanese guys I used to know in Vancouver. Um, I used to live with them as roommates a long time ago. And I invited them to my wedding and I wasn't, I was so worried that they were not going to come. But on the day of my wedding, uh, yeah, both of them came and I was just really happy about that. Anyhow, have you ever done retail therapy? Okay, so what is retail therapy? Retail basically means shopping, right? And therapy, usually when we think of therapy, we think of a therapist, somebody who talks to you and tries to make you feel comfortable and gets you to calm down and makes you feel good, right? Or hopefully makes you feel good or fixes your problems, your uh, mental or emotional problems. Uh, but retail therapy is the idea of like going out and shopping to make yourself feel good. So a lot of people might go out and buy clothes and then they feel good, right? And that's okay. Um, not for me. Or like, you know, you don't want to shop too much. It's a waste of money. Um, but have you ever done retail therapy? Yeah, I think I have. Like recently, I had to fix my computer, so I bought some different parts, I set it up in the computer and I got it to work, so yeah, I guess I did engage in retail therapy, but also I was happy because I could set it up properly, um, so that made me feel happy. Or do you have some other funny methods to make yourself happy if you really need it? Huh. 
do I have some way of making myself happy? Um, I probably have some bad ways of making myself happy or bad ways of calming down or feeling more relaxed. And one of them, of course, is smoking. So that is a really, really bad way. So if I could ever give you guys good advice is do not rely on an addiction to help you feel satisfied or to make you feel happy. Smoking is terrible. It's not good. I have to quit. Um, so take it from me. I am a smoker. It is not cool. It's not good. Don't get into it. Um, but other than that, to make myself feel happy. These days, like my younger daughter is less than two months. She's almost two months old, but she's becoming more aware. She's um, experiencing the world more. So to make her happy, sometimes I will pick up her little legs and I will move them around like she's walking and I will sing a little song to her, this made up stupid song that came from my imagination. And when I do that now, she starts smiling and almost giggling. She makes sounds and she starts moving around. And her reaction makes me really happy, honestly, because I can see like my daughter is happy. She knows my voice and she seems content. So that actually makes me happy. It's really stupid, but it, it's, it works for me. Anyhow, what would have to happen in your life for you to be extremely happy all the time? Okay. Well, I think that is completely unrealistic. Nobody is extremely happy all the time. So I'm not going to answer that question. But what would happen, have to happen in my life to make me quite happy? Um, honestly, I would like to be a business owner. I would like to be the owner of my own business and to be my own boss. I do not want to be beholden to anybody anymore. Um, besides the government, of course, you have to pay taxes. I would like to be my own boss and have a successful business. If I could do that, I would be happy. And if my family was happy, I'd be happy. Is it good to be happy all the time? Why or why not? That is a weird question. Is it good to be happy all the time? Probably not. If you're happy all the time, I would think you're probably stupid. Like there's probably something mentally wrong with you if you're happy all the time. Everybody experiences all the emotions in a given week or month or whatever, right? Um, no, being happy all the time is not realistic. That is a stupid question. Okay, last one. What does happiness mean? Ah, oh, geez. <laughs> what does happiness mean? <laughs> uh, happiness to me means being content, having all your needs met, right? You have shelter, you have an apartment or a house. You have enough food, you have enough water or access to a drink. Um, you also have a job or a career or at least a plan of what you want to do and you're working towards it. I think in this case, like a lot of people would say, well, maybe you're just satisfied. But for a lot of people, I think you'd be happy. Like I remember in the past, there used to be a lot of movies in the late 90s, early 2000s that used to say like, you know, leading a normal life, like having a nine to five job and all this stuff like, oh, it's so soul crushing and it's so awful and you know, blah, blah, blah. But nowadays, like since the financial crash in 2008, you know, the economy in Canada did recover, but not that well. And in addition to that, now we're dealing with the coronavirus. And I think the economic data and damage from the coronavirus hasn't really appeared yet and I think it's coming in the fall and I think there's going to be a lot of economic damage and I think a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and like a lot of people have lost their jobs already and I think a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. I think there's going to be a lot of economic damage over the next year but not just the next year. I think it's going to last for I don't know three to five years and so for me Hmm. Happiness is being able to have stability and having loved ones around you and seeing that they're happy as well. If they're not happy, it's going to affect you. So anyhow, that's my opinion. Do you know people who are truly happy? Not exactly. I know people who are pretty happy or at least mostly happy most of the time. Uh, my mom would be one of them. She, she worries about things, of course. She's a mother. Mothers always worry, but generally speaking, she's pretty happy. So she, yeah, my mother being happy makes me happy. Quick brainstorm. 
How many synonyms, synonyms do you know for the word happiness? Oh, there are so many synonyms for happy. A lot of them are expressions like to be a happy camper or to be on cloud nine, to be ecstatic. Um, so ecstatic is a good word. Ecstatic. Ecstatic basically means like very, very happy. To be stoked. Uh, ex just words like almost excited as well, right? So there's a lot of synonyms for happy. I'm not going to give them right now. Anyhow, guys, so let's end it there with the happiness sheet. We'll stop it there and let's move on to the actual listening. Now, I was taking a look at the listening before and the activity one here, I really don't like this. It says list the words below in the correct column according to their final sound. I don't really like this kind of pronunciation practice, so we are not going to do activity one here. Instead, once I get the computer working, uh, it goes to sleep after like two minutes for some reason. Instead, guys, what I would like to do, what password is wrong? Um, okay is just jump into this listening and while you're listening, of course we're going to listen two times, while you're listening of course what you guys want to try to do here is fill in the blanks. So let's listen twice, let's fill in the blanks and after we're done let's talk about it a little bit, right? Um, so let's do that and I'll explain some of the vocab. Okay guys, so here we go. I also need to fill this in, although I think I have a cheat sheet, but I don't want to cheat. I should get a pen and I'll try it myself. Let's try this out. Here we go. Okay, I guess this is me. Okay, all right guys, I don't know why that happens sometimes. Give me a second. Uh, oh, also there's some kind of pop-up here for some reason. Oh, Norton antivirus. Thank you, Norton antivirus. And Cacao Talk, why are you on? I don't know who uses you. Okay, here we go.
Okay, guys. Yeah, that's the song "Happy" by Pharrell Williams. Um, I actually really like Pharrell Williams. I think he's a good guy. Uh, it's not like I like a lot of his music, but I think that's a really good song. It's very simple. A lot of the vocabulary here is not very hard at all. There's a couple of expressions here and there that you know might be a bit confusing, but yeah, I think overall like it's a nice like happy song, right? And I, I like Pharrell Williams. Anyhow, well, let's listen one more time. And after listening one more time, we'll go over the blanks here. So let's try that again. Hopefully, it won't stop. And there we go. All right, guys, good. So we listened to it a second time. I think that is definitely good enough, like I said before. And like you guys can probably see, it's not like that was a really difficult song to listen to, right? Um, like there is a lot of repetition here. It's not that hard. 
Sorry, I'm just trying to close the computer. Uh, Microsoft Edge, I don't care. Why are you trying to get me to use you? Nobody uses uh, Explorer or Microsoft Edge as a web browser. You're garbage. Why don't you stop? Ah, you piece of garbage. Why are you doing this? I don't care, Microsoft Edge. Nobody uses you. Only, I don't know. Everybody uses Google. Nobody wants you. Okay. Ah, there we go. All right, so yeah, anyhow, what I was saying is it's a pretty easy song, but yeah, let's go over the blanks, right? Some of the blanks actually were kind of hard to catch. There were a few words that he said that were a little bit quiet in a certain way. So let's take a look, see here. Now let's break it down. We basically have five stanzas or five like chorus or paragraphs. Um, we'll just call them paragraphs, I guess. Uh, let's start with the first one here. Do, 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 do. So let's start with the first one. And ooh, we'll have to do this a bit quickly. Um, he said, it might seem crazy what I'm about to. And then this one was pretty easy. Might be, might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sun shines here. You can take a, what can you take? You can take a break, right? You can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way. Right? I think he said, by the way, you know, da 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 da. Um, anyhow, <clears throat> because I'm happy, clap along. If you feel like a room without a, and of course, we're getting into our second paragraph actually. Without a roof, he said. So a room without a roof, okay. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth, right? So roof and truth rhyme with each other. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah, you. You know what happiness is to you. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. And do and you rhyme with each other. Okay, now getting into the third paragraph or third stanza. said, here come bad news. Talking this and that. Yeah, well, give me all you got and don't hold back. Give me all you got, don't hold back. Well, I should probably warn you, I'll be just fine. No offense to you, don't waste your time. Here's why. Right? And he says, here's why. Okay, and then we get into our chorus in the fourth paragraph. Hey, come on. And then he says, bring me Bring me down, and down is repeated a lot here, actually. Can't nothing bring me down. Now, can't nothing bring me down sounds weird. It's like a double negative, right? Can't nothing bring me down. But it's kind of weird, but it, it sounds good anyhow. My level's too high. Like he's too high up in the air. He's too happy. Bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down again. And then I said, let me tell you now is the next one, which was actually really hard to hear. But anyhow, bring me down again. Can't nothing bring me down. My level is too high. So just repeating the first portion, bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. Oh my God. Okay. So we're repeating down a lot there, right? And of course, our last paragraph or stanza was just, hey, come on, bring me down, can't nothing, bring me down, my level's too high. Bring me down, can't nothing, bring me down, I said. Okay, guys, so actually, the rest of this here, like filling in the blanks, I think was incredibly easy. There is not really one difficult word within any of the blanks here. Um, so that's why actually I think this song is pretty good for 
like intermediate or lower intermediate level ESL students because there's nothing really that hard about it. Like, of course, he's singing quickly, right? But after you listen to it and you know the, the script, you know the song, you can understand the meaning here, right? Um, it's just a very happy song and Pharrell is just saying like, you know, um, like it might seem crazy about like just being happy all the time, but the happiness is truth, it's good to be happy, right? Like it might seem crazy what I'm about to say, sunshine is here, the sun is shining. You can take a break, right? You can take a break, you don't have to work. I'm a hot air balloon, so he's a hot air balloon, he's going to space, right? With the air like I don't care, baby, by the way. Because I'm happy, he feels like a room without a roof. Uh, clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Because I'm happy, clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Um, this song, which I think came out... Hmm, I don't know when this song exactly came out. Probably less than 10 years ago though. Either seven, eight, or nine years ago, maybe 2012, 2013, 14, it was a massive hit, right? People really love this song because it's just, it's so upbeat, it's so happy. I remember people were recreating this song in different countries, like over in Europe or Iran, Mexico, Brazil, wherever. I think this song really made people happy and I just think it's a really really nice song about you know trying I think he's like trying to convince people like you should be happy even if there's nothing happy in your life right now like choose to be happy I think that's his main point you should choose to be happy right life is tough but let's try to be happy and let's try to enjoy our lives because there's a lot to enjoy in life Anyhow guys, that's it for our class for today. However, of course, I must remind you that you guys have both a written and an oral quiz, right? Now, of course, you can take that anytime this weekend and then submit your quizzes uh, before class on Monday. Um, what I recommend, of course, is you would want to review the grammar part here, right? So you want to review comparatives and superlatives um, for sure. That's what you want to do. So you want to review comparatives and superlatives. Make sure you know all the rules for converting adjectives into the comparative form and the superlative form. And remember, there are just five rules, right? The first three are about one syllable words. Um, so like one syllable ending with an E, you add R. Uh, one syllable, short, three letter word ending in a consonant. You will usually double the consonant and add ER or double the consonant and add EST. One syllable with two vowels or two consonant sounds, you will just add ER. A two syllable word ending with a Y, re remove the Y and add IER or remove the Y and add IEST. And lastly, if it is two syllables or more and there is no Y, for the comparative form, add more or for the superlative form, add most. So make sure you review that and know the rules and know how to convert adjectives into the comparative and superlative form and take a look at some of those idioms. It's just a good sheet to go over anyhow. But that's about it for class today, guys. Have a good weekend. Good luck with the quiz. I will see you again. Maybe not next week, actually. Actually, no, maybe I'll see you on Monday, but except for that, I don't think you'll see me next week. Anyhow, have a good one. Bye-bye.